If you have your Bibles, I want to go to Leviticus as the as the key verse for this. And I want to give do a little bit of biology first before we go into the blood of Jesus. And I want to talk about your blood, actually, just normal blood. I'm, I never did biology at school. Well, I did. When I say I never did it, I turned up to the classes, but I didn't really listen. Um, and then when you had the options, I dropped biology. So I didn't really learn a fat lot about anything. But I do, I have, I, I do know enough. And I just want to talk about the blood. But I want to read from Leviticus 17, verse 11 to begin with. And it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your sins. For it is the blood that makes atonement for our soul. Um, are you losing me? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for your soul. Now, let me just read that in the Amplified. And he says this, that should be on the screen, the Amplified Version. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by reason of the life which it represents. Slight addition there to the end of the verse. Now, <coughs> you'll have heard the phrase, he bled to death. Yeah. Why did he bleed to death? Because the life is in the blood. And when the blood leaves the body, you die. Because the life is in the blood. Hence the phrase, yeah, we bleed to death. The blood is that life-giving substance which carries within it the life of the body. And I'm glad that John isn't here, because he'll correct me when I'm wrong. So that's good. That's good news. <laughs> but the definition of the blood that I've got here is the red liquid. I like that. So the red liquid. So it's a strawberry flavoured, no, the, the red liquid that circulates in the arteries, is that there Danny? The red liquid that circulates in the arteries and veins of humans, no, okay, carrying oxygen to and carbon dioxide from the issues of the body. So the, the red liquid carries oxygen, CO2, to us and it removes, sorry, it carries O2 to us and it removes CO2 from us, carbon dioxide. I do know enough of that. Four components of the blood. And all this is relevant as I, as I progress. Four components of the blood. Number one, the red blood cells. And these are the things that carry oxygen to, to all the cells of the body. Okay? Now, listen to this, how good God is. The human body creates around two million blood cells every second. Two million blood cells every second. How about that? Two million of them are the blighters. Every second. And in a man, here we go. Oh, well, I was going to make a comment there, but I won't. Men have about 4.7 to 6.1 million red blood cells per microliter of blood. <coughs> Women have slightly fewer. 4.2 to 5.4 million red blood cells per microliter of blood. Millions of the things. Carrying oxygen to and from all the, the, uh, the cells of our body. The white blood cells make up about 1% of the cells in our body and, and they are there to form a vital defense against disease and infection. Now, if you have too many or too few, when you go for a blood test, that's generally when they see whether you're ill. If you've got too many, it's not good. If you have too few, that's not good. It's fussy, isn't it? You got just the right amount. <laughs> And usually there's about 3,700, 10, 10 and a half thousand white blood cells per microliter of blood. So think about that. The red blood cells that, that carry oxygen, there's like 4.7 million. And yet the white blood cells that bring defense against infection, there's, a, there's about 3,700 to 10,500 per microliter. There's a lot, lot less. And obviously I haven't got into this, but there's various blood diseases that exist, which are identified generally when they do the white blood count. Yeah, too many or too few. 
There's another one, there's another component of the blood, which will be the platelets. And that's what will stop you from bleeding, okay? They interact with the protein within your, within your body to prevent or stop bleeding. And there's a final one, which is the plasma, which is mostly water that is absorbed from the ingested food and fluid through your intestines. Now, I'm no biologist and I'm, and I'm no doctor, but I have worked out blood is essential to, if we want to survive. <laughs> I know enough, okay? I know it sometimes, you know, some, some people say, you know, the little you know is dangerous, but blood is essential to survival. And blood is essential for maintaining um, health and life of a human body. Supplies oxygen, provides nutrients, and it removes waste min minerals, CO2, lactic acid, and it protects our body from disease, infection, and foreign bodies. And the one that I thought was interesting, your blood regulates your temperature. Thank you, Danny, I was waiting for you to wake up. <laughs> it, it regulates your body temperature, okay? So blood is important. It says in Leviticus 17, the life is in the blood. And, you know, we need our blood in our human body to function properly, otherwise we'll die naturally. Yeah. yeah? So when we abuse our body, and you know, by eating the, the rubbish that we eat, and not looking after ourselves, in a, you know, we're actually doing ourselves a disservice because we are not looking after our human body and the effects are seen in our blood. My father died of a blood disease, a lymphoma. He died of a blood disease. And yet, I'm going to come on today in a few moments. I'm not going to jump the gun. But he had a problem with his blood. He was picked up when he gave, um, he, he used to give he was a blood do a, a blood donor. And it was picked up that he was, there was an irregularity with his uh, blood cells. And that's when he started going on various tests and various different things and trying to eat more oranges and have more vitamin C and all that type of stuff. He'd always got orange in his mouth. Not a chocolate orange, the proper stuff. But blood is important. If there's a problem with our blood, then we're going to die. Spiritually, blood is important. Okay? And, it, and we know from reading in the Old Testament that it was the blood of bulls and goats that were generally shed on an altar, that were, that were killed, and their blood was shed on an altar to atone for the sin of the people in order to come into God's presence. Yeah? That's the Old Testament. And if the blood wasn't shed, there was no access for the high priest to come before God. But that was the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. And now what does it say in Hebrews? We have a new covenant, a better covenant. Why is it better? Because we don't have to slaughter a bunch of sheep and goats and, and bulls and various different things, or pigeons and doves and all these different animals for the various different sacrifices. We have one person that we know who shed his blood once and for all, not so that just the high priest could have access into God, because he became the high priest to allow us all access to yeah. God. Amen. That's why it's better. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? And I've got three points and a poem. No, I haven't. I've got three points. Next one, please. I have three points that I want to speak about to explain about the importance of the blood. Because you know what? I'll give you the three points now, then we'll go home. Forgiveness and cancellation of a debt through the blood. That's the first point. The second point is protection through the blood. And the third one is that we overcome by the blood. Three areas. There's tons I could say. Absolutely tons I could say on this subject. But I'm only going to focus on those three. Because I want to make this applicable so that when we leave this place, we can use the blood of our lives. Yeah. Because very few of us do. And I will say this, and she's not here, but I'm sure either Chris will tell her or she'll watch it on YouTube. Sheila messaged me and said that they just left home. I sent them a message, all the best on the holiday, the Isle of Wight and all the rest of it. And Sheila messaged me back and said to me, Keith, I've done something today that I've never done before. What's that then, Shields? Shields, I like that name. What you done, Shields? It says, I did what you said at the, at, at the discipleship college. When me and Steve left the house, we sat in the car and we prayed. And we prayed the blood of Jesus over the house and over our car and over our lives as we left to go on holiday. 
And I sent back and said, good on you. Good on you, girl. I think he's what I put. Good on you, girl. Very, very uh, formal type of reply. Because we've got to learn to use the blood. Yes. Okay, we've, we've, got, to, we've got to learn. And, it, it, you know, look, you're going to hear me say, think, that is why there's some people not here today. Now you're going to think, well, what, are you, what are you talking about? And I'm not focusing on who's not here, I'm focusing on who is, who is here. But, you know, sometimes you will get a thought in your head, don't want to go to church this Sunday. And that Sunday, the message is just for you. And if, and if, if the devil can get you to stay at home, You've just lost out on learning something that's going to help you in your life. Yeah. And we just think, well, I've had a busy week. We all have. I've got about 45 reasons why I could be at home watching the cricket this morning. Because it starts at 11 o'clock. And I like cricket. I used to play cricket. But you know what? We have to be here. Not because, well, we just do it out of habit. We do it because we want to come together. And not only do we receive... But we give our worship to God, we, we, we give to each other. By being here, it's an encouragement to each other. Yeah. And yet people are so flippant, mean, well, I won't go today, I won't go today. Yeah. God of the days when we privatised church. We've got this flippant attitude, this is my message, I'll give you this for free. <laughs> we have this flippant attitude, I promised I'd be nice to everybody this week. Because last <laughs> week I gave it some. But look... You know, people are just so, it don't matter. It don't matter what we don't. He could have done all that junk on the, on the Saturday to be here on the Sunday. We don't anymore. Because Saturday, I, I need to rest on Saturday. And Sunday, I've got to watch my car. And I've got to go and visit. And I've got to get shopping. And I've got to do all these things. Do it after. Do it after. Where's, you know, because where your heart is is where your treasure is. It is. And you can argue with me all day, but just read the Bible in Matthew. That's what he says. Anyway, God bless you all. I'm preaching to the converted because you, you're here. Well, let's go to Matthew. I've got a series of verses that I want to read to you. A series of verses. That I want to explain to you about the forgiveness and the cancellation of a debt through the blood of Jesus. And the first one there is from Matthew 26, verse 28. And he says this. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That's, that's Jesus speaking. This is my blood of the new covenant. See, Jesus didn't shed his blood for the old covenant. We, he had a new order that came in. And he said, because of his blood that was going to be shed, it's a new day. Yeah, it's a new day. And when, when my blood is shed, it's for the remission of sins. Now, I don't know if you like me, but you know, churches love banding around all these words. And when I saw that remission, I've heard that word remission a million times, but I wanted to make sure I knew what it meant. Because I'm sure we, we hear these words like sanctification. What's that, what's that all about? Sometimes we just talk about, use words as if everybody knows what we're talking about. And we sit there thinking, I ain't got a clue. But we don't want to ask because we don't want to be the one who looks stupid if we ask. He's, he's purity. Anyway, shed for the remission of sin. The word remission means a cancellation of a debt. He actually means forgiveness of sin. So when Jesus said, I'm shedding my blood for the remission of sins, what did he say? Which is shed for what? For many for the remission of sin. Not for the chosen frozen, but for everybody. For the, for the cancellation of a debt that had to be paid. That is the importance of our sin. Now let's go to Colossians. We've got a, quite a few verses to go through. It's just, it's just going to be a, a Bible verse, your trail. Colossians 1, verse 13 and 14. <coughs> verse 13 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom, so in whom the Son of His, in, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. Not because some goat was shed, yeah, but because of Jesus dying and his blood being shed. That is where we get the forgiveness of sin from. Let's go to Hebrews 9. There's a few to get through. Hebrews 9 verse 22. He says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Okay, so we can draw near... Knowing that we are, we are assured, 
having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. How can our hearts be sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water? All things are made clean through the blood of Jesus. Doesn't matter if you feel that you're scum. Doesn't matter if you feel bad. Doesn't matter if you've just kicked the cat on the way in. Or even just swore at the driver on the way in. The blood of Jesus cleanses us yes. from all our sin. It's important. Let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1, verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained, foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. See, for the, for the blood to work, it had to be pure, we know. That is why the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood of bulls and goats was shed in the Old Testament. It can't be any Tom, Dick or Harry whose blood was shed. It had to be somebody whose blood was pure. Now, why did I want to show you the, the components of blood? Because I want you to see how complex that blood is inside your body. So for the blood of Jesus to be pure, think about that. That was several million red blood cells. That was thousands of white blood cells. The platelets, the plasma, all those things that form the blood inside of you, that form the blood inside of Jesus, that blood, his blood was spotless. That's why it says in 1 Peter here that he was a lamb without blemish, without spot. His blood wasn't damaged in any way. My father's blood was damaged. That's why he died. It's naturally, because his blood was damaged. But Jesus' blood was not damaged. It was pure and spotless. And in Luke 22, Luke 22, verse 20, what does it say? Jesus says, this cup, the new covenant in my blood is shed for only one or two. It was shed for you. It was shed for all of us. Whether we receive that, whether we accept that, whether we believe that is not the point. The blood of Jesus was shed for each person in this room. So everything that we talk about is applicable to us. That's the key bit. Everything that we speak about, we apply to our own lives. Let's go to Ephesians. Didn't expect such a Bible study, did you? Ephesians 1 verse 7. He says, in whom, sorry, in him, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I said that is that is sweet. According to the riches of his grace. God was so gracious that he said, Look, you guys, you need more than a bull and a goat and a heifer and a pigeon and a dove and all the rest of it. You need more than that. Because I don't just want to relate to a high priest and then he goes and talks to the people. I want to relate to all of you together. And the only way that can happen is if Jesus Christ dies and sheds his blood for you, for me and for you. You know what? I don't do this very often, but let's yeah. say these together. The blood of Jesus was shed for me. The blood of Jesus was shed for me. Amen. Now, that sounded a bit prophetic, really, didn't it? Let's, <laughs> let's say it with a bit of conviction. Let's say it as if we actually... The blood of Jesus was shed for me. The blood of Jesus was shed for me. It's important because you know there'll be times, and I'm going to come on to this in just after this verse, when we will feel guilty for things that we've done and said. We'll feel guilty for things that have happened. And the only way to deal with that 
is by what? Bringing it under the blood of Jesus. It doesn't matter how we feel, we just bring it under the blood and we have the cancellation of the debt, the remission of sin, the forgiveness of sin, it gets dealt with. And we don't have to walk around, and this is a difficult, I understand this as a human being. Sometimes we think that if we feel guilty all day for something that we've done, then Jesus is more likely to forgive us. As soon as you've said, Father, I just realized I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have bit my wife's head off. I'm sorry, done. job done. You don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to feel down. You don't have to beat yourself up over it. You just, and sometimes our emotions feel Bleh. But yeah, you can pick yourself up and say, job done, let's just carry on as if it never happened. Why? Because the Bible says that we are justified. And I like the phrase, I heard this years ago, just as if I'd never sinned. So if you can do a groundhog day and just go back for seconds before you did what you did and how you felt back then, then that's how you can be. You don't have to be down and out and you just say, oh, it's done, I'm forgiven, we move on. Now some couples like to hang it over you and make you feel bad and say, oh, I would make you feel bad all day for what you did. But that's not the way Jesus operates. Fortunately, Jenny's not one of them. <coughs> she, she, she's not like that. Let's go to Romans 5. Let's go to Romans 5, and I want to read verse 8 and 9. And verse 8 is very important. I used to have this on, on my bumper stick on my car window. When I had my yellow mini, I love my yellow mini, with a sunroof, spots on the front. It would never go under 50 miles an hour. I don't know how it was my little mini, 995cc. Never go under 50. I have no idea why. But I had this, I, I had this on, my, on, on my window. Verse 8, Romans 5. But God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I had that on my window on my car. What, God demonstrates his love towards us that when we were born again and our life was all in order and everything was perfect, that's when Christ died for us. He died for us when we were sinners. Now, let me, let me attack a golden calf. I hear people say, oh, I'm a sinner. No, you're not a sinner. You were a sinner. You were. Get this religious junk out of your head. You were a sinner until you gave your life to Christ. Now I am saved by grace. Now I'm a child of God. Religion, oh, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. You dirty scumbag. You're a sinner. No, I ain't. I was a sinner. Yeah, I was, but I gave my life to Christ. Now he has redeemed me and cleansed me and removed all the sin from me. I'm now a child of the king. Not Charlie, not the king king. The king king king. The king of kings. King Charles is king. I'm no longer that sinner. Because, you know, when we have that in our head, I'm a sinner, we, are, we scratch around the floor like some little worm. Oh, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nothing, me. I'm nothing, you see. I'm just a, I just sin. No, no, no. You're the child of God. You may sin from time to time because we're not perfect. But we're a child of the king, child of God. The blood of Jesus has been shed to deal with all the sin. Cancel it. Remove it. Take it as far as the east is from the west, the Bible says. Yes. As far as is far as no, I don't know as far as the east is from the west, because you'll be looking for that forever. That's a long way. That's a long, 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 long way. But he says, We receive forgiveness. I haven't finished the verse, verse 9. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath. The wrath wrath through him. Judgment. Do you, are you born again? Yeah, I am. And then I hear people say to me, I love this one, and here we go, I'm going to attack another golden cough. <laughs> Don't leave. Can you lose your salvation? Like, I love this one. Right, this was debated when I was a teenager and I was on this youth team. That's the only stupid thing they used to discuss all day. And everybody used to lose their temper with each other. Can you lose your salvation? Let me say this. Is my salvation dependent upon me or dependent upon Jesus? Dependent upon Jesus. That's the, that's the answer to the question. 
I, I don't deserve to get born again. I don't deserve the blood of Jesus being shed for me. I don't deserve anything. So how can I earn my salvation? We don't earn our salvation, do we? No. We are bought by a price, and it's the life of Jesus and the blood that he shed. Based on that, the Bible tells me that we accept that by grace through faith. So my salvation is not down to whether I'm good or bad. It's not down to whether I've said something I should have said or said something I shouldn't have said. The constant in the formula is Jesus. Yeah. If you ever, you know, I like maths. If you ever want to do a math, oh, we've got a maths teacher. I'm not for <laughs> you should be saying this, I forgot. If you do formula, you've, you've got to have one fixed. Otherwise, you'll never be able to do the make the, make the calculation. If there's all these variations in, in the formula, how will you ever get an answer? You can't, can you? You've got to have something fixed, a fixed point of reference. And in, my, and in my life, that fixed point of reference is not me, because I'm the variable. I'm the one that's up one day down the next. What's fixed is Jesus. Amen. Now, religion ain't going to tell you that, because religion is going to try and get you to beat yourself up and feel guilty and feel bad. And I should have, and I should oh, if I'd have just, oh, I should have, oh, dear me. Nah, man. No. No. And I'll tell you, that, that, that gives us life. Now, my thing to you this morning, and I said to Jenny, don't worry, my first point, the second and third point even isn't as big as the first. So don't think I'm going to be here all day. But where I'm going with this, he says here that we're saved from wrath through the blood of Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me, coughing. Well, I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to throw this at you this morning, because this is what I want you to think about when we take communion in, in, in a few, few moments. Have we been forgiven? Talk to me. Yes. yes. Have we? have we? Have we allowed the blood of Jesus to wash over every area of our life? Even those little ditty bits that you've locked away. Because we will, you know, the, the phrase I've got written down here, because for some of us, we've scribbled away, oh, that's what we've scribbled away certain things that we've done wrong and certain experiences that we've had, certain bad behaviors that we, we're guilty over, and we've never taken the blood and applied it to those areas of our lives. Well, how do I know that? Because you still feel guilty, and you still feel shame, and you still feel bad about those areas, and if you would put them under the blood of Jesus, then you'd know that the guilt and the shame would be gone. Because yeah. there's no guilt and shame in Christ, is there? No. Because he doesn't reject you, he accepts us. So when there's areas of our lives that we've got squirreled away, we may have received Christ in part. I know this is going to upset some, but we, we receive him in part. But have we received the fullness of the blood in all areas of our life and heart? Why do I say that? Because I've told you, you know, I stuttered. And when I got saved at 17 and I went on a journey with me and God, we went on this journey of things that I had to deal with. Things that, you know, because none of us are perfect, even as a teenager, we're not perfect with things we need to learn. And you guys were older than a teenager. And I had to, at times, take that you know, blood and apply it to certain areas of my life. When God said to me, Keith, how about that attitude? How about that attitude? And then you think, okay. So you then you take the blood. This is me. It's what I did. I took the blood. And I said, Lord, I'll bring that attitude under the blood of Jesus. I repent of that attitude towards that person. I remember, and I'll say this, my mom might remember this, probably not. But I can remember vividly going three weeks. I have no idea why. I have no idea why I've got to stop on. But I went three weeks without talking to my dad. Okay, something pathetic probably. You know what I mean? Probably I didn't make him a cup of tea or he didn't make me one. Something ridiculous. But I can remember, and I was like, it's not for you then. I ain't talking to you. Three weeks that I wouldn't talk to you. But in those three weeks, God, took, God led me a merry dance. Because in those three weeks, he said, Keith, your attitude ain't very good. He's your dad. Don't talk to him. I ain't talking to him. It's not for you. I ain't talking to me, Dad. He can come and talk to me. I, I have no idea why. All right? I have no idea why. After three weeks, 
the conviction was on me that strong that it's like, okay, God, I've got to, you know, I don't matter what the short term pain is for me, I've got to put it right because the, 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 the conviction from you is that strong. I'd rather just put it right with my dad than, than have that from you all the time. It, 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 it ain't worth it. You're going to win, all right? You've won. So I bring it under the blood of Jesus. I repent. God, forgive me for that. Then you go to your dad. And my dad was very forgiving with all friends. Everything was fine and life goes on. But my, but my point is that's just a simple thing for me. We've all got things where we've had some attitude towards somebody or some problem with somebody. And yet we wonder sometimes because things go wrong in our lives and we don't realize sometimes there are consequences of things that are already in our hearts that we've not dealt with. And then we pray that God will deal with them. And God is saying to me, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday, I've said, listen to me, this is a friend of mine, listen to me. You've been saying the same thing for 20 years, mate. That's what he said, I said to him. I'll talk to you 20 years from now and you'll still be saying the same thing until you do something about it. He said, I know talking to you, I'll get a sensible answer. That's what he said. <laughs> you heard the conversation. I said, I'll come to you 20 years, I've known him for a long time. I said, I'll come to you 20 years from now and you'll still be saying the same thing. Why? Because you won't deal with it. I said, there's no point keep talking about it, mate. Deal with it. We've got to bring these issues under the blood of Jesus. That is why Christ said he died for you. He died for everybody. He, the blood of Jesus is important, guys. And if we want to grow as a church, and if and it, wait, last week, it's time to build. It's time to build. <coughs> Excuse me. It's time to build because we are. We can no longer stay where we were. And God says, come on, it's time to grow now. It's time to mature so that you become who I want you to be. So I'm going to invite you this morning to think. Some of you, from a physical health point of view, need to bring things under the blood of Jesus. Mentally, under the blood of Jesus. Emotionally, under the blood of Jesus. Relationships with people, under the blood of Jesus. Your money, your finances, under the blood of Jesus. It's important. It's very, very important. Because he says the life is in the blood. Do you want life or do you want death? Some of you are dying. Some of you are dying relationally with people. Some of you are dying financially. And you've got to bring these things under the blood. Because he says, we got, we got the lamb. The spotless lamb. And you know what? If we don't do it, it's as if we're throwing it back in the face of Jesus. You know what? The blood that you shed, the life that is in your blood, the sacrifice that you made, you know what? I am the special case. Because it's just not good enough to deal with me. If we don't do it, if we don't respond to him, we're not, you know, you're not a special case. You're not the one in a million, I'm sorry to say, because we're all the same. Jesus will come and he will help us. And why do I say it? It's not to tell you off, it's to bring freedom. Yeah. It's to bring freedom to our lives. Because I don't know about you, and I say this, and this was my heart, this is my heart over the years. I would rather. I used to look at myself and where I was and where I saw myself in, in uh, Jesus, in Christ, and think, that's where I can be, this is where I am. So I've got to do something to get from here, hither to thither, here to there. And I've got to deal with this, 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 to get me to this place. Many of us don't bother. Yes? You're glad you came, aren't you? Let's go to Hebrews 9. <coughs> Hebrews 9, verse 12. Hebrews 9, verse 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, Jesus entered the most holy place. Once and for all, for all, once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the puring of the flesh how much more shall the blood of Christ 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleansed your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And I'll say this for some of us, and I don't know who you are, but you've got a guilty conscience over something. You've got a guilty conscience over something. And yet God says, I will cleanse your conscience and give you that freedom. We'll be amazed about a freedom there is in Jesus. Oh, but you don't understand. You know, back in 1964, I did something that I shouldn't have done. Yeah, and bring that under the blood of Jesus. Yeah, but I shouldn't have done this. Bring it under the blood of Jesus. Yeah, but I've got this regret. Bring it under the blood of Jesus. But how about that? Bring it under the blood of Jesus. We live with stuff that we don't have to... Right, Steve's going to... Where are you going? Amsterdam. Right, we came back from Tenerife. <laughs> and like, you see some of these people, you can take on a certain hold luggage onto the plane. So some people take on four suitcases, five hand luggage, you get what I mean? They've just got tons of stuff walking on the plane. And, it, you know, you look at some people with all that luggage, and I'm thinking, how on earth do you pick it up? But if you, but I, but I look at some of you lot, and you were carrying around your holiday luggage all the time, as you in your normal life. You've got your your suitcase with your shoes and your makeup in, some of your and your air dryer and your air straighteners, and that's just Chris. You got you're carrying your suitcase. <laughs> you've got your suitcase full of stuff, and you've got your bag. I would say your bag of whiskey and fresh That would be that would be Julia. You got your bag. <laughs> You, you got your bag of duty free, and you and you carry all this stuff through, and you can hardly walk, and yet you try to live your life like that. And God says you don't have to. You can let go of all that baggage that's holding you back. Cance- I love that cancellation. Yeah. Cancellation of a debt in our lives. Man alive, talk about freedom. Yeah, yeah but I bought. You know, if I'd have known more, I'd have been a better parent. Well, you didn't know any more, did you? And it was the way it was. So you, there's no need to feel guilty over it. Yeah. We all can do things better when our children are 20. Well, when they were three, we didn't know what we were doing. Did we? Well, I didn't, did you? I didn't have a clue. You know what I mean? As long as they, as long as we fed them, changed the nappy, they went to sleep, jobs are good. And then watch Andy Pandy, jobs great. We've always think, oh, we could do a better job. We could have done a better job. Oh, if we'd have done a better job, they wouldn't be like they are today. If we'd done that different, they wouldn't be like this. We did what we did with the knowledge that we had. We don't have to live with regret. <laughs> you bring that under the blood of Jesus. Yeah. You bring it under the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter chapter 2 verse 13 in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom you have been who you believed you were sealed with the holy spirit of promise who is the guarantee of inheritance all the until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory you think what's all that about well, i'm reading the wrong chapter yeah. <laughs> Ephesians 2 verse 13 but now in Christ Jesus who who but now in Christ Jesus you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Amen. the blood of Jesus is what gives us access to God yeah. there are times when we don't feel good enough and we, and we think, we feel that we pray and for some reason the lead in the roof of the building is stopping God from getting through. Yeah? Or well, you've got too much in your attic and God can't get through the boxes of shoes in Julia's loft. <laughs> so he can't get, you know, we have access through the blood of Jesus. And we are drawn near to him. We don't have to. Be scared or fearful or think that God is at a distance. God is right there with you all the time. And I like this. I wrote down here, 
is in close proximity to you. We don't have to think or, or, or feel, oh, I feel God, God's here today. I don't feel God, well, you must be on holiday. No, 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 he's still there with you. Not because of our feelings, but because the blood of Jesus gives us access to him. Secondly, time is gone. Next one there, Dan. The protection by the blood. This is short. Let's, let's go to Exodus. And I want to just read a little bit here. <coughs> Exodus 11, 1 to 10. And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out from here altogether. Speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. And Moses said, Thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn of the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals. Then there will be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor will ever be like it again. But against none of the children of Israel shall the dog move its tongue against the man or beast, that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And all these servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, and all the people who follow you. After that, I will go out. Then he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. The Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you. Doesn't that sound like some Christians? Pharaoh will not heed you, so that my wonders will be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did all the wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. <laughs> And he did not let the children of Israel go out of his land. You know, we've, we've read the story, we've watched the film probably, you know, Moses, Prince of Egypt, probably. If you've got children, you have anyway. And they wanted to leave Israel. Israel wanted to leave Egypt. They had the nine plays, here's the tenth, we're going to collect the firstborn of everything. <clears throat> and yet Pharaoh's hard, heart had been hardened. And his heart was still hardened. He became more stubborn and stiff-necked to God's leading. And I have to be honest, I'm, don't you think this is like some Christian people? It doesn't matter what God says to them and what, what God is preached in church, some people just will not listen to what God is saying. And unfortunately, that seems to be the way of the world, that the Egyptians knew better than Moses and the Egyptians knew better than the leader of the Israelites and the Egyptians knew better than God. Christians. They know better than the leader, the pastor. They know better than everybody else. You can't talk to them. They know it all. They're right. They know everything. And yet their life is in a mess. They're the ones who live with stress, not me. Happy day. Happy day. Let's go to Exodus 12, verse 7. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat. Verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men, man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment, because I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Verse 22. And you shall, and you shall take a bunch of hyssop. You dip it in the blood that is in the basin. Strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door. I will not allow the destroyer, there is a destroyer guys, you will not allow the destroyer to come into your house to strike you. 
listen to me. The angel of death exists. And the angel of death is not just some, some being who comes when there's a disaster in the world. The angel of death is looking to destroy. He said, when the destroyer comes. The destroyer is seeking to destroy Christian people. Yeah? yeah? The angel of death is coming to destroy you. It's true. There is a, there is a, many, a, a, a devil and a demonic cohort that is looking to destroy Christian people. It's, Jesus said the devil comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. But I have come to give you life and life abundantly. My point is this, we must learn to re and remember to pray the blood of Jesus over our lives for that same protection. Yeah. The, I thought about this, this isn't an arrogant comment. I heard somebody say this and this is what I do. When I go away, when I get on an airplane, I pray the blood of Jesus. When you eat some turbulence, you're grateful that you did. But I, I can say, and, this, and this, this is not meant to be arrogant, but that everybody on the plane are going to be safe because I'm there. And I've prayed the blood of Jesus on that place, upon that airplane. We've said it before, when we leave the house, we pray the blood of Jesus over the car, over the house. That's where Sheila got it from. Before we leave. Went to Tel Aviv, we did the same. Two o'clock in the morning, Jenny will pray. That's what we do. When the children were tiny and, and I'd take them to school, I would sit in the side road, if you could remember that. We'd sit there and the thing before the children got out of the car to run to school is what? I'd pray every morning. Do you remember that, she says? We'd do that in the car. I'd pray the blood of Jesus upon them. And I'd do that now, I did that this morning. <laughs> Over me, Jenny, and me, Daddy Zoe, and the dog, and the car, and the house. And the land of the house. That's what I do. Because he says, when the blood is on the doorposts and the lintel, the lintel of the doorposts, that angel of death will pass over you. This is where the Passover, you know, this is where the Passover started. And I, it, it, you know what? If the devil is looking to destroy somebody, and I don't mean this wrong, he can destroy somebody else. He ain't going to come to me. Yeah. If he's going to take somebody else out, he can take somebody else out. He's not going to take me out. I told you the story. When I was going to Hockley Pentecostal, I was 18, I think. In my little yellow mini. I've got some stories about it. I've got a wonderful car. Me and my little yellow mini is going to pick up a couple who lived along um, just off Cinderbank, Shorter Lisa. And I picked them up, and on the way to pick them up, we were going over to down the Hadley Road off to Hockley Pentecostal Church. At the time, all those years ago, it was a place to go on a Saturday night. So that's where we were going. As I was going, as clear as anything, pray the blood of Jesus on the car, Keith. These words came to me. I'm simple, okay? So I pray the blood of Jesus over the car, over our wives. Pick up Sean and Lisa. I'll get to Langley, where I'm joining the Birmingham New Road where you turn right. What's that restaurant place along there? Raffles or something, what's it called? There's a... One of them. Whatever, one of them. There's a restaurant, there's a, there's a crossroad. I'll turn it right. I'm in the right hand lane to turn right. There's a Mercedes on my left, Mercedes opposite. Lights go to green. I'm accelerating. I told you my car doesn't go under 50 miles an hour. My, my little mini. So I'm, lights go to green. I'm off. As I go, somebody presses the foot brake in my car. My car comes to a stop. The Mercedes turns right. The Mercedes comes up my inside. They smash each other's cars and I'm safe. When I did that, ah, now I know why I, I prayed the blood of Jesus on the car. I don't know who pressed the, the brake pedal down. He won me, I ain't Jake the pig with three legs. Yeah, I've, got, I've only got two. I've only got two legs. One was on the accelerator, the other, the other one was on the floor. But my brake pedal went down. God protected me. We're not always aware of things that are happening to us. We don't know who's driving in the opposite direction. And you know what? We can't always rely on our, our ability as a driver. We may be good. We may be trained as a brilliant driver. We may be a pack of rubbish. Who knows? But when we pray the blood of Jesus on us, God will always protect us. 
And we've got to do that. When you leave your house, you know, pray, pray, pray. Now, there's a phrase that people use. It's not in the Bible, but they use it because Lynn does. They plead the blood of Jesus is what they say. Not in the Bible. The phrase doesn't exist in the Bible at all. I've, I've looked and searched. It doesn't. But the term, what it means really is, and it's an old-fashioned term, it's just a phrase declaring of Jesus as power over the satanic realm and his schemes. That's what the phrase means when they plead the blood. It's no different to saying, I'm praying the blood of Jesus over my life. Some people, it's an older style of language where we plead the blood. Okay? You don't have to use that language. You know, Jesus is, you know, he's up to date. You can simply say, I pray the blood of Jesus over my family, over my life. And it's important because you don't know what's coming at you. You don't know who's coming with you. You drive, you walk through Birmingham on your, on your own. You haven't got a clue who's going to come at you. You know, not every, you know, not every place in the UK is, is, is like Wordsley. You get protection, just like God told Moses and the Israelites, pray the blood over your house. Do it before you go to bed. Do it before you go to bed. Protect your house. Thirdly, Danny, final one, and then we're going to take communion. Overcome by the blood of the Lamb. In Romans 12, verse 7. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon was, and his dra angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. For the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, who was cast into the earth, and the angels were cast with him. Then I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren, I know a few Christians were like that, Accuse the brethren. I wonder who their father really is. Accuse the brethren before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives unto death. The testimony is as simple as, next one down, looking after the baby there. It's just, it's just a spoken statement. The words that we speak. It's just the words that we speak. Why is it important? It's important because there's life or death in the power of the tongue. And it's important that we say the right thing over our life. Because, you know, when you are in trouble and when you feel ill and when you're tired and when you be careful what you say. Oh, my back's getting worse. I can't walk. I can't work. I can't walk. Oh, you know, I'm going to catch it. I'm going to catch it. I'm going to catch what? I'm going to catch some fish. I'm going to catch it. Oh, I'm going to catch it. Think about what you're saying, guys. Think about what we're saying. We overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the words that we speak. And with these two verses, I'm finished. Psalm 107, verse 2. What do we say? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom is redeemed from the hand of the enemy? I was trying to find a song that we used to sing back in the 90s and I couldn't find it. But let the redeemed of the Lord, here's a cracking song as well. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Guys, that's what we need to speak of in our lives. I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. There's power in what we say. There's power in what we say. Psalm 118, verse 17. I shall not die, but live. And declare the works of the Lord. I shall not die but live. And if I was saying it like Winston Churchill, <laughs> fight upon the beaches. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. There is power in what we say.